Ares Aiden is Assistant Professor of Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine, where he directs the Center for Genome Architecture. He's also a professor of computer science and applied math at Rice University. In 2012, he received the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, the highest honor given by the US government to young scientists. In 2005, Erez and fellow Harvard doctoral student Jean-Baptiste Michel were interested in two things that seemed to have little in common. One was the study of history and human culture, and the other was scopes, microscopes, telescopes, things like that. They thought, wouldn't it be great if we had something like a microscope to measure human culture, to identify and track all those tiny effects we would never notice otherwise? Remarkably, they built one, the addictive online tool called the Google Ngram Viewer. Unfortunately, Jean-Baptiste is unable to join us this evening, but please join me in welcoming Erez Aiden to tell us all about their remarkable creation. Hey, it's a tremendous uh, pleasure and honor to have the opportunity to uh, address all of you. Um, what I want to tell you about is uh, an adventure um, that my uh, co-author and I uh, went on. Uh, the adventure was an attempt to read five million books. Uh, that's a lot of books, so in principle that might have taken us a very long time. Um, and I want to tell you about it. Uh, my, my collaborator looks kind of like this. His name is J.B. Michel. He is with us in spirit. Uh, books uh, look kind of like this, at least they used to. Um, if you want to learn about history, there's a lot of history in books. Uh, you know, people typically write at some time and some place, and so even if they don't mean to be writing a book of history, they are to some extent attesting to what life was like at a particular time, in a particular place, the things people cared about at that time and place. So if you want to uh, learn about uh, the past, it's a very reasonable thing. You know, you would think it would be a great thing to do to just read lots and lots and lots of books, ideally to simply read everything that had ever been written uh, in the history of the English language. Uh, this was one of my goals when I was six or seven years old. We had, we had a big set of uh, encyclopedias on the wall, so I planned to read them from A to Z, and then when I was done, I was going to go to the Brooklyn Public Library, which was several blocks away, and I was just going to read that next and just keep going uh, until I'd covered everything. I would venture to say that I would have known a great deal about history were I to have achieved that feat, uh, in some sense, if there is a y-axis for awesome, uh, reading everything that has ever been written uh, is, is extremely awesome. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, one of the things that uh, I discovered, uh, I think many people uh, discover this eventually, is that if there is an x-axis for practical, uh, it turns out that that's not too practical, and so typically, uh, if you're a person or a historian interested in a particular period uh, and what's going on, what you end up doing is reading, say, a handful of primary sources or books or manuscripts, whatever they may be, that are relevant to that particular place and to that particular time. So that's, that's most of how history is studied today. You look at a small bit of the historical record, and uh, you see what you can glean from it. But things are changing for the historical record, and they're changing in very, very important ways. And one of the things that is uh, happening to the historical record uh, at the present time is that more and more and more of it is being transformed uh, by digital media, and in particular, uh, Google has been digitizing books. Uh, so Google's, the stated goal of the Google Books Project, which was inaugurated in 2004, is to obtain a copy of every single book, uh, in fact, every single edition of every single book that exists, uh, and to scan it in so that it can be read on the internet and on e-readers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, 
computers, um, by virtue of this sort of digitization, uh, suddenly have access to all of these books simultaneously. Um, and, you know, if you have, so if you have all these books digitized, in principle, you can analyze all of them uh, at once. And so that has the potential to be uh, practical, since the computer is doing it for you, but also really awesome in the sense that you're actually getting a global view on what the historical record looks like. Now, of course, we have to be uh, realistic about the limitations of modern artificial intelligence, of modern computation. A computer is not nearly as clever when reading a book as a human is, or certainly as a human uh, historian is when they read a book. Uh, so they don't get quite as much out of it. Still, they can compensate for that uh, on occasion uh, simply by the fact that they can do it for all books. Uh, and so uh, JB and I, you know, when, when the Google Books project got started, said, hey, you know, this is an amazing opportunity to try experimenting with doing history uh, in a very, very different way. So where do books come from? Just to get everyone on the same page, it's worth putting that out there. Uh, authors have been trying to write books uh, since time immemorial, and on 129 million distinct occasions, they have succeeded. Now, that's not a number that used to impress me uh, at all until uh, JB and I actually wrote this book, which was really, really hard to do. And then I looked again at this slide and I was like, really, this has been accomplished on 129 million different occasions? Um, and that, that definitely put, uh, you know, some of, I guess, our major life challenges into perspective for me. Uh, so they've managed to pu publish these books. And where do the books go? They typically go to libraries or sometimes they're stored in publishing houses. And now Google has basically been systematically checking out essentially entire libraries, uh, building, you know, one building at a time. And what they do with these books is they digitize them. So uh, essentially they take a picture of every single page, often by literally taking the book and flipping through every single page um, in the entire book, taking a picture uh, as they go. Uh, and then they use a technique called optical character recognition to transform those pictures of books into text, uh, into raw digital text of the type that you have in, you know, Microsoft Word or in a text document. Um, that's very, very good. Now, when they digitize all of these texts, uh, they associate the resulting data with uh, metadata. So. Typically things like the name of the author that wrote the book, or when the book was published, all kinds of information about the book. Uh, it turns out, though, that there's a lot of mistakes in the metadata, um, which is not really a big deal if you just mean to read the book. It doesn't bug you that on some page of the card catalog, it says that it was published in 1731, when actually it was published in 1994, uh, but if you're trying to uh, analyze this book as a computer, uh, this can be very, very confusing. Uh, and so when we first were playing around with this data, our computational algorithms told us that people in the 16th century were very interested in nuclear physics and other um, <laughs> things that didn't make a great deal of sense. Uh, so one of the things that we discovered is that the card catalogs in many libraries have mistakes in them and that we need to systematically write, you know, programs that throw out bits of the card catalog, throw out card catalogs, throw out books that have anything uh, at all suspicious about them. And having done that, uh, we managed to throw out 10 million books. Um, now. That is, you know, just an unfathomable number of books to get rid of. That is, you know, a vast corpus. But fortunately, what we were left with was five million books uh, for which we thought the data was pretty good. Uh, not necessarily super great, but, but pretty good. And uh, just to give you a sense of uh, scope on these texts, so five million books uh, is about 500 billion words worth of text. Uh, were you to write it out, it would stretch from here to the moon and back 10 times over. It's about 1,000 times longer than the Human Genome Project. Uh, if you tried to take 
all the books published in any particular year in our data set uh, and just read them without taking a break for food or for sleep, it would take you several centuries. So it's a lot of words. Um, anyway, faced with such bold and outrageous analogies, uh, JB and I did what uh, seemed like the only reasonable thing to do uh, to two people in graduate school. We took a page out of the XKCD webcomic and said, stand back. We're going to try science. <laughs> a big issue with science uh, is that when you do science, and if the science is at all interesting, other scientists then want to do it. Um, either because it was interesting and they want to do it themselves, or because they thought it was terrible and they want to demonstrate how terrible it was. Um, if we wanted to analyze these books, well, Google had them and that was great, so we could do all kinds of analyses and we could publish the results of those analysis, analyses, and that would actually be super great for us because we could publish it and say, oh, but you know, if you want to check our work, you can't because we can't possibly share any of this data with you. Um, that would have probably been very convenient for us, but would have been no fun for the rest of the world. Um, so we said, if we're going to do this, we have got to be able to share some of the underlying data. And so we thought, what data could we possibly share? And the first thing that struck us is, well, we've got these five million books, right? They seem pretty great. So why don't we just share all these five million books uh, with the world? Uh, and so we proposed this to several of our uh, counterparts at Google. And uh, you know, it did not take very long uh, before uh, we learned some practical lessons in science. Um, so someone at Google actually taught us an important equation. They said, well, look, five million books, I bet they have five million authors. I bet that's going to lead to five million plaintiffs in a massive lawsuit <laughs> that will be the end of your little research project. So, despite the fact that releasing the full text of all five million books, if there was a y-axis for awesome, would be extremely awesome, it turns out uh, that if there was an x-axis for practical, it's not terribly practical. So, we had to come up with something else, uh, and what we hit on was this idea of n-grams. So, an n-gram, uh, and that's, I think, the only sort of technical terminology I, I plan to have in this talk. It's not very complicated. Uh, it's a word from natural language processing that just refers to a string of characters with a certain number of spaces. The long and the short is that the word the is a one gram. The word uh, the store is a two gram. The United States is a three gram. The United States of America is a five gram. So it's just typically a word or a phrase. Uh, n-grams. So what could we do with n-grams? So we had the following idea. We said, why don't we just take every single n-gram that uh, appears with non-negligible frequency in the English language, and we'll just make a table that records how often that n-gram was written in every year going back five centuries. And we thought that would be a very, very interesting table. And you know, while we're at it, you know, if we've already done English, we might as well do French and Spanish and uh, Russian and Chinese and uh, six other languages, now actually seven other languages. So we made this table of n-grams, and we thought, well, um, one thing that's terrible about these n-grams, of course, is that we lose all the context, right? If someone says, you know, the Beatles, you can't tell if they're saying the Beatles were a really great band, or the Beatles were totally terrible and reflect the utter, you know, dissolution of society. You just can't tell what people were saying because you lose the context. But the thing is uh, that when you stop talking to scientists and start talking to lawyers, that turns out not to be a bug, but a feature. Uh, because you could argue that this was not a violation of the fair use provision in copyright. And this seemed very reasonable to two uh, such uh, well-trained uh, legal minds as JB and myself. Uh, and so we said, well, let's just go with it. In, in fact, actually, there's been a subsequent case law uh, now with the settlement of the Google Books and the approval of that, uh, terms of that settlement by uh, the courts. Uh, there's now actually case law that basically says that creating n-grams tables is uh, fair use, but at the time that was total speculation. Anyway, so we're going to make these tables of n-grams, and we're going to share those n-grams with the world, we're going to use those n-grams to do science, and this seemed like a good idea. 
at the time. Anyway, I want to tell you about engrams and why they're interesting, because so far I think I haven't made any convincing uh, points about that, <laughs> and, and I better, given how long I've been up here. Um, so let's suppose that this talk uh, goes well. Um, you know, strain our imaginations. Let's suppose this talk goes well, and uh, you know, I'm gonna tell my mom about it. Uh, there's a three hour time difference with New York. I'm not gonna be able to tell her about it after the talk. Um, I would wake her up. So I'm gonna call her tomorrow, and I'm gonna tell her about how well this talk went. And I'm gonna say, Mom, it was great. Yesterday, I really throve. But then I'm probably gonna think for a moment, um, you know, gosh, is that quite right? Maybe I should say, yesterday I really thrived. Uh, which, how do you conjugate that word? Um, and pretty much before the n-grams data existed, the following was the state of the art in terms of what you knew about how to conjugate the word thrive. So you knew that if you asked the following linguist uh, with fabulous hair, and you said, Steve, you know, what should I say? He would say, well, these days most people say thrived, uh, but uh, you know, some people say throve. You also knew that if you went into a time machine uh, and you went back 200 years and you talked to following distinguished statesman with equally fabulous hair, and you said, Tom, uh, you know, what should I do? Uh, Tom would tell you, well, in my day, uh, most people throve, but some people thrived. And that's pretty much what you knew. So now what I'm gonna show you is just two entries uh, from this table of n-grams that we have that just show the frequency of the word thrived and the frequency of the word throve over time. So in every year, for instance, we take the number of times we see the word throve and divide it by the total number of words in that year, and that gives us the frequency of use of throve and the frequency of use of thrive. And here it is with uh, single year resolution going back two centuries. So what's interesting about this is that linguists have been writing about this process, they, they call it regularization, uh, in which an irregular verb, one that doesn't end with ed, like throve, becomes a regular verb, one that does end with ed when conjugated, like thrived. They've been talking about this for decades, speculating about you know, whether it happens, how it happens, what are the things that influence it happening. But it wasn't possible to, in any meaningful sense, actually see it happening. And now we can see these kinds of changes. Now, I think this slide is pretty awesome. And the best thing that I can say for the n-gram data set is the following, which is that this constitutes two of the two billion n-grams in our table. So the full data set is a billion times more awesome than this slide. <laughs> now, the fun thing with n-grams is that you can kind of point it at whatever you like. Uh, you can tackle, I mean, this is a pretty practical question, what is proper grammar for conjugation of the word thrive, but you can tackle very abstract concepts, like how does society forget, right? That doesn't seem like a uh, concept that a scientist can do terribly much with, but I think we can actually do rather a lot with it uh, when you look at it from the standpoint of engrams. So for instance, let me tell you about the, uh, the history of the year 1950. It turns out that for the vast majority of history, no one really cared about 1950 uh, through the 16th century, the 17th century, the 18th century, even the 19th century. No one was really paying attention to the prospects for 1950. Uh, this continued actually well into the 20th century through the 1910s, the 1920s, the 1930s. No one gave a damn about 1950. But then, Sometime in the mid-40s, there started to be a buzz. <laughs> People realized that 1950 was going to happen and that it could be big. But nothing got people interested in the year 1950 like the year 1950 itself. <laughs> During the year 1950, people were walking around as though obsessed. Pretty much everybody was thinking about all the things they hoped to do 
in 1950, all the goals they hoped to achieve in 1950, all the dreams they hoped would come to fruition in 1950. In fact, 1950 was so compelling that for several years thereafter, people continued to feel the need to discuss 1950, to just debrief about all the fascinating things that happened. Then, after a couple of years, suddenly the bubble burst and 1950 became a little bit passe. You know, people started to think, you know what's gonna be really interesting? 1960. Now this story, uh, the story of 1950 is the story of every year that we have on record. Boy meets uh, year X. Boy falls in love with the year X boy breaks up with the year X and slowly, over time, forgets about his ex. <laughs> but one of the interesting things about being able to look at this with engrams is that we're not limited to purely qualitative observations. One of the things that's very striking is that when you look at different years, I, I think you can see that, for instance, 1883, it drops off. Uh, 1950 also drops off but 1883 drops off a heck of a lot more slowly than 1950 does. And this is generally true. This has nothing to do with the particular three, choice of three years that I've put up there. Uh, for any three years, you'd see the same sort of thing, which is that more recent years uh, tend to uh, get forgotten more rapidly. People stop talking about them more and more and more rapidly. Now, why is that happening? I, I really don't know why that's happening. Um, I would love to present you uh, with a fabulous, you know, complex mathematical theory that explains why this happens. And uh, in truth, I'm, I'm sure that I could. Uh, you know, I'm sure that, you know, I could present one such model and then present another completely different such model and then a third completely different such model and they would all, you know, predict this, but I don't think that actually anyone really knows why this happens. And this is one of the funny things about the n-gram viewer, which is that you can ask it a simple question and it can give you some insight into that question, real bona fide, genuine insight, but leave you with as many mysteries as you started. So yeah, it seems that there are changes in the ways that society forgets. It seems that we forget the past somehow faster with each passing year, and yet, exactly what does this engram mean? Exactly how does that work? That's far beyond the capacity of the data to tell. Well, we don't just forget about old things. Uh, we're constantly learning new things. Society's constantly learning new things. And this is actually an example of something uh, that, that people have been uh, fascinated by for, for some time, actually, a conversation. Uh, I think the first you know, notion uh, of, of uh, you know, this type was in a conversation between John von Neumann, the famous mathematician, and Stanislaw Ulam, famous physicist. Uh, and they were talking and John von Neumann said, you know, I think the rate of technolo you know, technological progress is accelerating. It's getting faster and faster and faster. Um, you know, and if it keeps, you know, getting faster like this, I think we'll hit some sort of technological singularity. Uh, and I think some of you may have heard of that concept, which has become increasingly popular in the wake of Moore's Law, but there's this underlying idea that somehow the rate of technological progress is getting faster and faster and faster. Well, how can we measure uh, the rate of technological pro progress? That's very, very tricky. Um, well, it's one of the kinds of things that n-grams can be quite useful for. So we can play the following game. Let's look at the n-gram for uh, telephone. So telephone is invented in 1848, more or less, actually. No one agrees about when the telephone was invented or who invented the telephone, and every once in a while some major government body issues some announcement, you know, like the Canadian government weighs in on the question of who invented the telephone because, you know, everyone wants someone from their country to have invented the telephone. Anyway, it's a big mess, but ballpark around 1848, the telephone gets invented. Um, well, what's interesting about the telephone, though, is it takes several decades for people to really start talking on the telephone and talking about the telephone. The telephone takes decades to get adopted. That's not true for all inventions. For instance, consider the radio. The radio was invented in 1895. Very shortly thereafter, 
people are using the radio very extensively. The radio is an invention that gets very, very popular uh, very fast. In some sense, it's like the portable music player of the late 19th century. Um, so inventions can take longer or shorter to get adopted. Now we can start looking at this systematically. So for, on, for instance, you can do the following thing. It's very, very straightforward. On some level, it's very, very silly, but you can do this in a whole bunch of different ways. I'll give you one example here, and they all more or less give you the same answer, which is we can go onto, for instance, Wikipedia and download a list of inventions and when they were invented. Uh, and we can group them uh, into different bunches, right? We can take this red bunch which is inventions that were invented in the early 19th century, uh, or this green bunch, which is inventions that were invented in the late 19th century. Or we can look at this blue bunch, which is inventions that were invented around the turn of the 20th century. And what we're doing here is we're sort of combining all of them and looking at their average frequency over time relative to their peak frequency. So we're seeing, you know, for this bunch, how long does it take uh, for people to start really talking about it? And uh, what you can see is the inventions from the early 19th century uh, take a heck of a lot longer to start getting talked about. Uh, for instance, they only hit their sort of 25% of their peak frequency after 65 years. In contrast, the inventions from the turn of the 20th century take only 26 years to hit that same milestone. What you see systematically in the data is that newer inventions seem to be becoming more frequent, uh, becoming more widely discussed much, much more rapidly, that the cultural adoption of new technologies uh, is increasingly rapid. Now, whether that leads to uh, an imminent future in which all of us merge with a global uh, silicon consciousness uh, is uh, above my pay grade, but it's interesting to be able to deploy real data at problems as abstract uh, as these. One thing that can be a lot of fun with Ngram's data is, you know, to sort of just do the People magazine thing, right? Look at famous people that, you know, appear in the Ngram's data, and there's all kinds of famous people uh, in the Ngram's data, folks like Charles Darwin and Henry Ford and Che Guevara, and in fact, people become famous for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, for instance, Orville Wright, he became famous for learning to fly. Or Ernest Rutherford, he became famous for his scattering experiments. Here I'm actually showing uh, the most famous people, uh, or five of the most famous people that were born in 1871. And you can see all the different routes uh, in which people uh, become extremely famous. Wright or Rutherford or, for instance, Marcel Proust, he became famous because he wrote good books. Uh, actually, uh, by show of hands, I'm curious, how many people uh, here know who Cordell Hull is and how he made this list? So yeah, a small, a small minority. Uh, out of comparison, how many people here know who Orville, Orville Wright is? Right, so everybody knows who Orville Wright is. What's interesting is actually, uh, you know, year over year in terms of total fame over, uh, you know, the 20th century, Cordell Hull is more famous than Orville Wright. Cordell Hull is actually the valedictorian of the class of 1871, the most famous person born in the year 1871. How is it that Cordell Hull is so darn famous? Well, Cordell Hull was actually the longest serving Secretary of State. He served under, under FDR in uh, World War II, and uh, he was uh, one of the instrumental architects of the United Nations. In fact, he was referred to as the father of the United Nations by FDR. Uh, and so, you know, in some sense, the valedictorian of this class, you can see why they were so prominent. You can see the profound legacy that they left. But interestingly enough, Cordell Hull has actually not aged uh, quite as well uh, as some of the other uh, extremely famous people on this list. Now, one of the things that's kind of funny that you notice when you look at these lists of, of famous people uh, is that if you take, for instance, the class of 1871, and then you sort of say, well, on the average, what does the class of 1871 look like? Uh, you can see that every year sort of, uh, uh, you know, has a, exhibits this sort of typ typical behavior. So here the average is shown in this gray line. Uh, but in fact, this trajectory would look roughly the same no matter what the year of birth is. If I did the same thing for 1872, uh, the 50 most extremely famous people would be different. Uh, but their average uh, trajectory uh, would be, look roughly the same. So, 
again, all we're doing is we're just taking the 50 most famous people born in any given year and then computing some sort of average. Um, now, that's weird that this curve keeps coming up, you know? In some sense, I would call it uh, a grand unified theory, except that that's way too over the top for taking the average of a bunch of curves. So I'm gonna call it the grandee unified theory instead. Uh, anyway, what is this curve telling us? This curve is telling us, for instance, let's take folks who were born in 1871. For the first 37 years of their life, they are not noticeable in the data. They're not really famous. Now, what does it mean to not be famous? Well, you know, that's a big abstract discussion. I don't know what the answer is to that abstract discussion, but we needed something. And so what we did is we said, well, what are the least frequent words in the dictionary? The least frequent words in the dictionary have a frequency of about one part per billion in the English language. So basically that tells you that if you're used at a frequency of more than about one part per billion in the English language, you belong in the dictionary. So by our lights, um, we're essentially saying, you know, people are noticeable in the language, people are famous uh, if their frequency of usage is frequent enough that they ought to be a word in the dictionary. Now it turns out that until 1908, the class of 1871 isn't really famous. So it takes about 37 years until on the average, the class is famous enough to belong in the dictionary, until the majority of the class uh, is famous enough to belong in the dictionary. But then what happens actually after 1871, after, excuse me, after uh, 1908, when they make their debut at the age of 37, uh, is that they get more and more and more and more famous over time. And, uh, these tick marks correspond to powers of 10. So this is 10 times as famous, or 100 times as famous, or 1,000 times as famous. Um, so these guys are actually getting their fame is doubling, basically about every half decade or so, until they hit their peak fame in 1946, at age 75. And then after that, they're slowly forgotten. It takes about, uh, for the class of 1871, it takes about a century for their frequency of mention to decline by a factor of two. So, in some sense, the half-life of the class of 1871 is uh, 100 years. What's interesting about this is that these parameters, although the curve, again, looks the same year after year, these parameters seem to be changing. So, for instance, in the early 19th century, it took a heck of a lot longer for people to become famous, to make their debut. Uh, typically would be in the early 40s. Today, uh, the most famous people of their generation typically become famous uh, on the average at age 29. Uh, when JB and I actually made this observation, uh, JB was 28, uh, but, but I was 30. So I, I related to it, I think, with uh, a great deal more concern than he did. Um, now, the age of peak uh, is typically pretty similar, actually, over the centuries, although the most famous celebrities of today are far more famous uh, than uh, celebrities of earlier generations because this acceleration uh, gets more and more rapid as time goes on, but they pay a price, which is that the rate of post-peak decline used to be about 150 years or so, but for the most famous people of the mid to late 20th century, that rate of decline is only about 75 years. So people today get more famous and get famous at a younger age, but they're also forgotten faster than ever before. Now, um, I see that there are some uh, young people in the audience, and uh, you know, one of the things that's very challenging uh, when, you're, when you're young, you're trying to figure out what do you want to do with your life. You have many, many different options. Um, and one of the things that challenges you go to people and you say, could you give me some advice? And they always give you something, you know, very like loosey-goosey, like follow your bliss. Well, I don't know how that resolves the problem. So I just want to give you some data, some practical data to use in making practical decisions in your life. So this is uh, data based on the 25 most famous people in uh, six different professions. 25 most famous people who lived in the 19th century. And it's just showing the average trajectory uh, of these people over time as a function of their age, as a function of their time since birth. Now, if you want to be famous young, so we're assuming that you know, you're successful in whatever profession you've chosen, you're one of the 25 most famous members of that profession. If you want to be famous when you're young, you should be an actor. Actors typically become famous in their uh, mid to late 20s. Uh, 
uh, and now you can enjoy many decades of fame. One of the tough things, though, uh, about the 19th century for actors is that mass media for actors like television didn't exist yet. So actually, if you're willing to delay gratification a little bit, you're actually better off becoming an author. That way you can benefit from things like the printing press, get your name out in front of a lot more people. Uh, the authors in this list have to wait longer. They typically don't get famous until their mid to late 30s, but they soar to a much higher level of fame than the actors, so waiting pays off. If you're really good at delaying gratification, uh, oddly enough, it makes sense to become a political figure. Political figures are basically largely unknown until their late 50s or early 60s, uh, but then you know, to make the top 25, you've got to become president of the United States or the head of state of some other uh, very, very influential country. Um, and then you rapidly soar to the top of the list. These are all reasonable options. Um, somewhat less appealing from this standpoint is becoming a scientist, right? If you're a scientist in the 19th century, the most successful scientists do eventually become as famous as the most successful actors, but it's only in their 70s. Artists uh, become about half as famous as the scientists. Uh, but one thing, actually, that, that a lot of people get tripped up on, uh, you know, this is sort of a rookie mistake, is, you know, mathematicians are very famous for doing their best work when they're young. Uh, you know, so you think, well, this is just great. You know, I'll do my best work when I'm young. You know, be my, you know, done with it by my mid-20s. Then I just put my feet up on the desk and enjoy myself. Uh, the trouble, according to this plot, is regardless of when mathematicians do their best work, uh, the work of mathematicians is typically just not noticed at all. Um, the uh, uh, mathematicians on this list only have an appreciable uh, signal by the time they're 70 or 80 years after their birth, by which point most of them are dead. Um, anyway, I, I have a PhD in applied mathematics, and my PhD thesis included uh, the figuring out of this chart. Um, it's, it's too late uh, for me, but, uh, you know, but this is a rookie mistake. This was avoidable by looking at the data. There are uh, a lot of fun things that you can do with the n-grams, but there are also uh, extremely sobering notes, extremely tragic notes amidst the billions of engrams, and I want to show you uh, a number of them. This is the trajectory of Marc Chagall, an abstract expressionist. Uh, here's his trajectory in the English language, uh, and this is a typical trajectory uh, of a famous person makes his debut at some point, becomes more and more and more famous. This is actually an effect that my wife uh, first noticed in the data. Here's Marc Chagall in German, now in green. This is an incredibly strange engram. You just don't see people doing this uh, under ordinary circumstances. You can look at thousands of engrams, you don't see this kind of thing. He becomes famous and then totally disappears. In fact, there's an eight year period in the German engram data, uh, in which his full name appears only once. And then, after uh, a while, he rebounds, you know, comes back from, uh, you know, from a complete disappearance. So what's going on with the data here? And of course, what many of you have, uh, I'm sure, realized is that the period from 1933 to 1945 is the Nazi regime in Germany now. Uh, the Nazis had very, very, very strong opinions about abstract expressionism. They did not like it at all. Um, and they had uh, even stronger opinions about Jews, of which Marc Chagall was one, uh, and they didn't like that at all either. Uh, and so you systematically see many of the targets of Nazi censorship and suppression exhibit these characteristic decays. One of the things that's actually striking is, I think it's very hard for us in this day and age to imagine what it is like to live in a totalitarian state, 
uh, in this day and age in, in this state and in the United States. I think we, we find it hard to imagine what it must have been like, uh, what it is like to live under a totalitarian regime. Um, how much of an impact can a totalitarian regime really have on the thoughts of, of people in that time and in that place? Uh, it's striking to, uh, you know, in consequence of that, to, to start looking at Nazi Germany, where the censorship and suppression campaign was actually very, very systematic and very well documented. In particular, uh, there's this uh, person named Wolfgang Hermann who was, um, you know, unemployed actually for much of the 20s, and uh, you know, is this librarian. And he spent a lot of time going through the library and identifying books that he thought were a bad moral influence, but no one was really paying any attention to him until in 1933, uh, the Nazis came to power and he became a member of the Purification Committee tasked with cleaning up the cultural life of Berlin. And so now he had this list. Uh, you know, people suddenly get word that Wolfgang Hermann has this list of books that are a bad uh, influence, that are morally pernicious, according to him. Um, and suddenly he's got customers. Uh, the Nazi student organizations uh, started rioting uh, in, the, uh, in 1933 uh, because they wanted, uh, they said, to purify German culture. And they reached out to Wolfgang Hermann and said, could you give us your list? We want to get rid of all of those books from libraries throughout Germany. And in fact, Wolfgang Hermann's blacklists uh, became the official blacklists uh, of the Nazi regime. They were the basis of the uh, book burnings that took place throughout Germany in 1933. Um, and they've had a, just a tragic impact on, uh, on German culture. The lists are extremely organized. Um, Herman actually classified the lists according to uh, the type of work. Uh, classified works about religion separately from works about history, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so one of the things that we can actually do when looking at engrams is we can see the systematic impact in different uh, modes of discourse of this blacklisting campaign. Now, what you can see in this chart, and we include a list of, of Nazis as a control, just so you can see that their frequencies indeed increase uh, during the Nazi regime. What you can see in this chart is that pretty much if you're on the blacklist, your frequency of mention declines. Um, but what's, what's actually quite tragic is to realize the extent to which the suppression campaign was uh, far more effective in some areas than it was in others. So if you're writing about religion, the frequency of mention of a writer on this list decayed by a f declined by a factor of about four during the Nazi regime. If you were writing about history, uh, there's a decline also, but it was only about 10%. So it seems that, you know, at least from this evidence, the suppression of uh, folks writing about history was less effective uh, in Nazi Germany than the suppression of, of people uh, with dissenting views on religion. Um, of course, this is not anything close to the full story uh, of what went on. Obviously, it does not even scratch the surface, but it is uh, important to be able to start looking at these sorts of effects, which we would have only known about qualitatively, uh, in these sorts of quantitative ways. It gives us new insight, and it also opens up the door to new possibilities for preventing this sort of thing in our own day and age. So to that end, I wanna show you something that we can do that I think is, uh, has some interesting potential uses. So here's the trajectory for Henri Matisse. So again, looks kinda of like Marc Chagall. Now, we can, because these dips are so pronounced, we can just automate, we don't have to have a blacklist to figure out that someone's being suppressed. We can just kind of automate that whole process. So we can create some very, very sort of boneheaded model that says, well, look, you know, how frequently should someone be mentioned during a period of time? It should be roughly a weighted average of their frequency of mention before and their frequency of mention after. And so we can compare their actual frequency of mention during that period of time 
and we can say, oh, are they doing better than we expect or worse than we expect? Now, this is a pretty boneheaded model, but uh, for most times and most places, it turns out that the ratio between what we expect and what we see is roughly one, and I apologize, that should be the number one uh, right there, not, not the number zero. So most of the time, that boneheaded model works pretty well. This is uh, names in English uh, versus this model from 1933 to 1945, but it's not specifically English from 1933 to 1945. It turns out actually pretty much uh, anywhere, uh, pretty much any time looks like this, a tight distribution around one, no effect. Um, for instance, the number of people who uh, are, do more than, uh, who are, uh, differ more than fivefold from what you would expect from this simple linear model uh, is less than 1% in the English language. So the model works pretty well. Here's what the distribution looks like in German, in German uh, from the period 1933 to 1945. This is totally anomalous. It doesn't look like this in uh, almost any other time and place. The whole distribution has shifted to the left. Pretty much if you were sitting around 1933 making predictions about who was going to be widely discussed in the future, uh, you would do a terrible job, right? Everyone is doing much worse. Uh, everyone who would have predicted would be influential based on the 20s and early 30s is just doing much worse uh, than you'd expect. Um, it's also a much wider distribution. So you have these extremes on the right where uh, what you're probably seeing is actually the effects of Nazi propaganda to prop up the frequency of mention of particular people. And then what you see, you know, very tragically is on, on the left, right, you see huge numbers of people who are, uh, who, where their frequency of mention is far, far lower than what you would expect based on the simple model. In fact, more than 10% of this distribution uh, is, is more than fivefold suppressed. Uh, it's just a, a vast amount of distribution. We can see there's, there's very, very little in English, you know, where you see, you know, suppression of more than fivefold, right? There's tons of it in German. And if you look at the names that come out of, of this, so we're just essentially running every single name that we have access to uh, through this little test. If you look at the names that are coming out at the extremes, it's folks like Pablo Picasso, right? Again, another modern artist, someone who the, not, whose work the Nazis were not um, interested in at, at all, except, well, where they were very interested in it, they uh, were hoping to, you know, sort of get rid of it and publicly humiliate that, that whole approach to art. Or one of the most extreme values on distribution, this distribution is, is a man named Hermann Maas. He was a Protestant minister who publicly spoke out against what the Nazis were, were doing, uh, for his trouble, he was actually the target of a personal campaign by the Ministry of Culture uh, in Nazi Germany to, to suppress him, which was uh, very, very effective. Um, as you can see, um, ultimately, he was actually recognized as one of the uh, Righteous of the Nations by Yad Vashem for his efforts uh, during World War II to speak out. Now, what's striking about that is that this sort of approach, it's not just relevant for looking at historical examples of suppression, but it's something that one could imagine doing uh, in contemporary times to uh, significant effect. So, for instance, uh, here are the trajectories in, in light gray uh, and in dark gray um, for uh, the word Tiananmen in Chinese uh, and in English. You can see there are two major incidents in Tiananmen Square, one in 1976, one in 1989. One in 1976 is widely discussed in China, by and large not really discussed in the United States. The main one that is discussed in the United States is the Tiananmen Massacre, Square Massacre of 1989. Um, it's discussed a lot in the Western world, right? Just soars up and people keep talking about Tiananmen. Uh, in China, there's a tiny blip and it disappears. Now, people talk all the time about uh, the uh, suppression of information about Tiananmen Square in China, very often it's just anecdotal. People say, you know, look, this novel, it talks about Tiananmen Square 
you know, folks still talk about it in China. And there's been a lot of studies, you know, documenting the uh, suppression of Tiananmen Square by the Chinese. Uh, one of the things that you can see here is, you know, it's not a single anecdote, but just very, very broadly, uh, the data makes clear the extent to which there's really no discussion, um, minimal discussion of Tiananmen Square uh, in China as a whole. Uh, strikingly, actually, so, so uh, you know, these books sell at auction, um, and uh, we have a couple of pages in the book where we talk about Tiananmen Square and we talk about this chart. Uh, and when our book went to auction with Chinese publishers, uh, we started to get notes from various Chinese publishers saying, um, oh, we're very, very, very interested in publishing your book, uh, but wouldn't you uh, please be uh, so kind as to remove the you know, pages such and such to such and such, uh, which in fact are the pages that discuss this n-gram. Um, so it turns out that our n-gram documenting uh, Chinese uh, suppression of Tiananmen Square is itself banned in China. Um, now, one of the things that's actually potentially quite useful about this is, I mean, t Chinese censorship is actually very active on the internet right now on websites like Weibo, uh, where it's kind of the Chinese equivalent of Twitter. And one can imagine if you could do real-time uh, suppression detection, which is a practical thing um, that we are, we're looking at trying to do, um, you could figure out what was being censored or suppressed at any given moment in time and just report it. Say, look, you know, this particular meme is now being actively suppressed in the following sort of way, right? You know, tweets about it um, are uh, not coming up on, on Weibo. Uh, maybe don't use the following hashtag, use some other hashtag. So anyway, I think the types of things that we're talking about here, I think, are um, interesting from the standpoint of history, but are also very applicable from the standpoint of keeping information free in modern times. One of the nice things about the Ngram data is I don't have to just tell you about it. All this data is public. You can go to books.google.com forward slash ngrams, uh, and you can do any number of uh, queries to your heart's content. Um, you know, for instance, this one, uh, someone was interested in uh, the United States are versus the United States is. Uh, when did people start using uh, the United States in the singular? There's been a lot of ink spilled on that particular topic, um, and it's by and large not terribly consistent with what the data uh, actually tells us, so that's pretty neat. Um, anyway, the one word of warning is that I think uh, this was, uh, website was described by Mother Jones as, uh, well, I don't think it was, uh, I think Mother Jones described it as the greatest time waster in the history of the internet. Um, uh, and I want people to bear in mind that they said this after the release of Angry Birds. So this is high praise. And this website is a very addictive website. Um, you might lose your weekend. Uh, I've lost many a weekend with this data set. Um, zillions of people have used it. It's actually now part of Google's online dictionary. So whenever you define a word uh, from the uh, Google website, it actually pulls up some of this data for you. Um, and, you know, I'm very happy. I like all two billion of the n-grams. I'm very proud of all two billion of the n-grams. But, you know, you do have some of your favorites. So of the zillions of queries that people have run, um, I wanted to just take a moment to show you the one that I think uh, is the best. Uh, so this particular person uh, who ran this query was very, very puzzled. They said, you know, it's very strange. These days, everyone is trying to put their best foot forward to do their best, to be the best they can be. But somehow, before 1800, no one seemed interested in doing that. People instead talked about being their best and doing their best. Now, how, why could that possibly be? Are they just striving for mediocrity? It's interesting. The, the reason for this is actually uh, the following. This is, uh, this is something called the medial S. When the letter S was written, uh, either in the middle or at the beginning of a word, it was typically written differently. It looked a lot longer, a lot more like an F. Uh, 
And in fact, the uh, optical character recognition that we used transformed this into an F pretty systematically. Um, so what you're actually seeing is a change in the history of typography, the abandonment of the medial uh, F, uh, the medial S, and its replacement by the ordinary S. In fact, the medial S is why uh, the integral sign looks the way it does in calculus. It's supposed to look like a big medial S. Um, so it actually turned out that this was not a bug, it's a feature. And people have done some, uh, that's great, right? Every time something goes wrong, we just <laughs> decide why it's great. Um, but actually, you can do all kinds of stuff to study the history of typography using the n-gram viewer. In fact, the speed with which the medial S got replaced uh, in English typography was a surprise. I've actually, I've gone uh, to history departments and shown this plot and had people, you know, sort of stand up in the audience and, you know, if I was said, well, I want to tell you something about the medial S, and then I had actually someone stand up and like, you know, tell me for like 10 minutes about why I was terrible, because they had very strong opinions about how the medial S had disappeared, and then I showed them the data, and you know, we parted as friends, but we no longer disagreed about the medial S, because the data is very, very compelling. Um, so anyway, you can do stuff with the history of typography. Um, <laughs> but look, you know, realistically, you know, not everything is, you know, that is a bug can be explained away as a feature. Occasionally frustrating things do happen. Uh, I'm just gonna put that out there. And you know, some things are more frustrating than others. For instance, let's suppose you stub your toe. I would say that that's like a 1A arg. <laughs> In contrast, suppose your planet is annihilated by the Vogons to make room for an interstellar <laughs> bypass. <laughs> I would call that an 8A arg, and in fact, you can track, uh, with, with real data, you actually get non-trivial counts out of this. You can track anything from the 1A to the 8A arg using the n-gram viewer. Now, this particular person um, only did the first four. Uh, and you can see, and this, this seems like pretty good news, um, you know, increasingly frustrating things are increasingly rare. So that's good. Um, except, in the early 80s. Uh, I, I have no idea what happened that led to such a surge in uh, category two frustrations uh, in the early 80s. Now look, you know, we've been telling you so much about the past, but I wanna take a little bit of time and look to the future. Uh, and I would like to do that with uh, the uh, XKCD webcomic, which is a very future forward looking comic. I think everyone has different standards for success in life. Um, I think uh, you know, one of my standards for success is to have my work lampooned by XKCD. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very thankful to have achieved that major life goal. Um, but this is actually, this is not totally a lampoon, this is real data. So, Randall Monroe took real data uh, for the frequency of the word sustainable in US English texts. And it is plotted here on uh, this webcomic graph from XKCD. And you can see that sustainable is getting a heck of a lot more frequent. This is a logarithmic scale, right? Each of these is a power of 10. So things, you know, sustainable is getting a lot more frequent. It's getting more frequent very, very rapidly in the last few decades. So then he says, well, look, you know, at, at these rates, let's, let's think a little bit about the future. And he makes a series of startling predictions. He says, at current rates, by the year 2036, the word sustainable <laughs> is going to occur on the average once in every page of English texts. By the year 2061, <laughs> the word sustainable is going to appear on the average once in every English sentence, as it did in this one. By the year 2109, 
all sentences in the English language are going to constitute simply an endless repetition of the word sustainable, 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 sustainable. sustainable. After 2109, it is anyone's guess what is going to happen to the English language. Randall Monroe's startling conclusion could not be more clear. The word sustainable <laughs> is unsustainable. <laughs> so this webcomic was an inspiration uh, for us, and I think you know, one of the uh, things you can see, oh, excuse me, one of the things that you can see is that actually a lot of uh, all of the graphs in, in, in the book as well as in this talk have been patterned on uh, XKCD uh, because it's a very beautiful visual style, you know? It's fun to look at data when data is as fun looking as this. Um, but the questions that he raises are interesting questions, right? Can we try to use n-gram data to predict the future? Uh, on the one hand, there is this little voice in my head that says, Erez, that's completely nuts. But there is this other voice in my head that says, well, why not try it? So here's what we did. Here's the last n-gram that I'd, I'd like to show you, the last n-gram-based analysis that I'd like to show you. So what we did was actually a uh, takeoff of uh, what Eugene Fama did to, uh, which actually got him got the Nobel Prize. So he did this with the stock market. He said, look, um, can you predict the stock market? Let's look at things, that stocks that tend to go down and see if they keep going down, and then we'll look at stocks that tend to go up and see if they keep going up, and we'll draw some conclusions about whether you can make money exploiting uh, trends in the stock market. And he concluded that you can't. Uh, and this was a great idea and got him the Nobel Prize. So he said, well, why don't we just, you know, try uh, the same thing with n-grams? Uh, and so in black, you can see we've taken a bunch of n-grams that go on a 20-year streak. Uh, and in that 20-year streak, they just get more frequent every single year for whatever reason. Uh, and then we took uh, in gray uh, a whole bunch of other n-grams that went on a 20-year sort of negative streak. They got less frequent every year for 20 years. And we said, well, look, you know, let's try the simplest possible prediction, which is that you know, things that are going up will keep going up, things that are going down will keep going down. Uh, and then we track them for another 80 years or so, and it turns out that things that are going up do keep going up, and things that are going down do keep going down. Um, and again, this is one of those times when the n-gram data is, is quite vexing. Uh, because on the one hand, I feel like I get to decide whether I'm going to use the word sustainable in this sentence or not. Um, but on the other hand, the engram seem to disagree. Uh, you know, we may have free will, but it does seem that there are certain cultural trends that, you know, just tend to roll on whether we like it or not. That our culture, on some on some level, uh, can behave in a deterministic fashion. Uh, that's weird and puzzling and uh, an uncomfortable idea, uh, but. The data thinks so, uh, and the data is pretty compelling on this point. So can we predict the future? I guess sometimes maybe we can. Uh, certainly, uh, if there was an active uh, stock market, if there is anyone in this uh, audience who is a market maker and is interested in making a market for the frequency of mention of words and phrases, please let me know, because JB and I would like to make a killing on it. Anyway, um, you can also, since you know this is just such a fun style, we, we decided we'd make an extra website, xkcd.culturomics.org, where you can plot uh, your n-grams in a fun xkcd-like style as well, because it's just so effervescent. Um, the big message that I think emerges, you know, from the work that we and others have been doing, and that we, you know, use the book as an opportunity to think about and meditate upon and, you know, uh, speculate about is this idea that the historical record is going digital. It is becoming increasingly digital with each passing day, and that's not just books, it's newspapers, it's manuscripts, it's maps, it's artwork, and it's also the stuff, you know, going forward, 
probably someone in this audience is wearing Google Glass. There are people with Google Glass who simply index their entire life uh, in a searchable form. You know, the libraries of the future are not merely going to have the biographies of famous people, they're going to have complete end-to-end -end recordings. Now, the results of that, the results of a digital historical record, the possibilities for visualizing that record are going to transform how we look at our own past. So we wrote this book about it. Thank you guys very, very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. We have time for a few questions. The first question's on your left. Do you think it's possible there's anything in the other 114 million books that you didn't look at that will change what the data looks like? Um, well, so let's think about it this way. Uh, when, when they take a, so the answer is yes, but um, there are things that, that, could, that could influence the data, but I don't want to undersell this on, on a certain level, which is that if you think about a presidential poll, right, a typical tracking poll by Gallup will look at like a thousand people. There are like 50 million registered voters, vast numbers of registered voters. So what you're sampling is a tiny percentage. Here, in some sense, we're taking a survey of authors, but the survey constitutes like five, per, you know, I didn't, so actually, I'm sorry, I think the number of registered voters is about 130 million, right? Gallup, when they do a poll, will poll, let's say, like 2,000 people. Right, so we're not polling 2,000 of 130 million, we're polling 5 million of 130 million. In terms of statist the statistical representativeness uh, of this poll, we think we're doing pretty well. You know, with that said, it's certainly the case that there are probably some systemic deviations uh, between what we're looking at and the population of books as a whole that has to do with how libraries prioritize their digitization, uh, book digitization in uh, partnership with Google. The bigger confound is I don't think coming from all the other books. I think it's coming from other types of media, right? So books are it's just hard to get people to publish your book, right? It's easier to write an article in the newspaper. And so, uh, and the types of things that get published in books are very, very different than the types of things that get discussed in newspapers. So. What is really important to think about is all the different social registers and the ways in which they encompass different aspects of our culture. Books are really one aspect of culture, and it's amazing to have a you know, non-negligible fraction of books to play around with, but newspapers surely are going to tell a very different story. Magazines are going to tell a very different story. Uh, letters are going to tell a very, very different story. Uh, you know, today, we all write emails. Those emails are you know, in existing digital form, and if, uh, you know, folks rally around that and um, it ultimately leads to some sort of email historical archives, those are obviously represent a very different register of people's thoughts and ideas. Any other questions? All right, well, Ares will be signing in the atrium after the talk. Thank you.